call the meeting to order, please. This is the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees regular meeting for Thursday, August 4th, 2016. The time is 7 o'clock. Please call the roll. President Sells. Here. Trustee Ballerine. Here. Trustee Lumsden. Here. Trustee Pollock. Here. Trustee Sedeby. Here. Trustee Hamilton. Here. Village Manager Francis. Here. Village Attorney Molina. Here. Also present Village Clerk Haley, not with us tonight, is Trustee so Collins. So far, we do, we do expect her. Okay. <laughs> Okay, if you'll please rise for the play. Thank you. Thank you for everyone who's here tonight and for those of you watching at home. If you are here with us tonight and you'd like to make a comment at any time during the meeting, just I just ask that you be recognized by the president and that you make your comments at the podium so folks at home can hear and see what you have to say. First up tonight uh, are presentations of public comment. We have a presentation by the Landscape Advisory Commission concerning the official Tree of Riverside candidates. Uh, this is the political season. I will ask everyone in the room to please withhold your applause until all candidates have had an opportunity to deliver their stump speech. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Ms. Maloney. I am Burr Oak, and I earnestly seek your vote as the official tree of Riverside. If, like me, you are worried for the future of your little acorns, you should vote for me. I have lived in Riverside for more than 100 years, so I have seen everything from the jazz age to the digital age. Average life expectancy for my species is 200 to 300 years, so knock on my wood, I hope to see your children and their grandchildren grow with me. My formal name, Quercus macropa carpa, means oak with big fruit. I don't mean to brag, but have you seen my baby acorns? They are larger than most oak children and sport the cutest fringed caps. I tend to have large nut crops every few years. This is a clever strategy on my part called masting, wherein the proliferation of acorns fields wildlife, but also leaves a chance for plenty of acorns to grow to maturity. Of course, I am native to this region. My silhouette is instantly recognizable on the Great Plains. I am about as wide as I am tall, sadly, 80 feet in width and height with strong, outreached branches. Because of my deep taproot and fire-resistant bark, you can often spot me as the lone survivor in an oak savanna where natural fires burn and then rejuvenate the native prairies around me. I will fight for the environment. I stand up to urban pollution. This means that I am a tough and can pretty much handle anything thrown at me like road salt, air pollution, and other unnatural conditions. And I really do my part to clean up the environment by reducing greenhouse gases and providing stormwater interception. At my current diameter in Guthrie Park, I deliver about $260 annually in savings. Each year, my leaves absorb about 1,500 pounds of CO2, and my roots take in almost 5,500 gallons of stormwater that could otherwise overwhelm Riverside's storm system. So I invite you to take a look at me. I'm out in Guthrie. I'm one of the five candidate trees that have the big green ribbons on them. And as you know, we'll be voting is open now. You can go on the Riverside website and vote. Or there are paper ballots in the library that you can use to vote. And uh, please don't miss the great tree bait which will be Thursday, September 1, when all of us will be debating each other, uh, moderated by an informed uh, individual about uh, arborist-type things, and also fact-checked by our village forester, Mike Collins. Now I will cede the table over to Catalpa. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest tree of all? I am, of course, elegant and majestic. My cluster of white bell flowers and lovely heart-shaped flowers gracefully adorn parkways, yards, and parks. 
The fragrance, fragrant smell of my delicate bloom sets me apart from my inferior competitors. At full maturity, I am 40 to 60 feet tall, providing welcome shade and attractive bark. Don't let my overwhelming beauty fool you, though, as I am a hardy species with tolerance to adverse conditions like drought, poor drainage, and I adapt to different soils. If that isn't enough to get your vote, then consider my added gift of leaves that turn a stunning yellow-green come fall. I also drop long, whimsical seed pods. Children love to play with them, and creative types use them as natural decorations in bowls and centerpieces. It's pretty clear that I am the superior candidate and soon to be the official Tree of Riverside, so vote for me. Thank you. Well, I'm the third part of comic relief tonight. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm a strong candidate to win the tree election, and I bring a variety of qualities needed in a tree leader for our community. I produce shade, nuts, and durable, valuable wood used in some notable homes in Riverside. I am long-lived, usually up to 80 or more years, and provide nesting space for squirrels, birds, and other animals. Black walnut is native to our area, and the local Indians were eating these nuts as early as 2000 BC. My color is deep green in summer and golden yellow in fall and the leaves are not hard to rake at all. Because I produce a substance called juglone, which discourages other plants from growing too close to my trunk, you can often recognize my presence as outstanding in the field, straight and tall, with few other trees crowding in. My nuts are encased in a green husk that smells somewhat like limes when fresh, and when ripe, the walnuts themselves make delicious cake and ice cream. The shells produce a black dye that has been popular since the 16th century, and it was used to tint cotton, linen, and wool for weaving and knitting in early America. My shells are also placed in the nose cones of NASA rockets because they withstand such high temperatures before carbonizing, and walnut wood was used to make plane propellers in World War I because it was tough and rot resistant. Crushed nut shells are still employed as a way to grind off paint and clean machinery. So with such versatility, how can you not vote for me? <laughs> so are we going to hear from the other two candidates? Or? I have to talk to you guys. They're on the, uh, on the trail, so to speak, in Guthrie Park. What, so. what are the other two candidates? The other two are white oak and red oak. So some people say, you know, the oaks are trying to split the vote. So they can throw it to Catalpa, who certainly is the most modest, I would say, of, of all the candidates. We've had some people uh, talk about that, and, and there are some, some birthers who are questioning the nativity of some of the oaks in the Catalpa area. So it's a little bit of a So when, when is the election going to actually be tallied? Uh, voting is open now. Uh, you can go onto the website, uh, the uh, Riverside website, or you can go over to the library. It will be open until uh, September 9th. September 9th. And when will the winner be announced? September 9th. September 9th. Great. Okay. What time of day is the tree bait? Uh, the tree bait is at 7 p.m. in the library. And that was September 1st? September 3rd is September 1st. Great. Well, thank you, thank all you the all. candidates, for coming. We appreciate hearing from you. Uh, next up is public comment, Mr. Galagos. Good evening, Mr. President, trustees, those in attendance, and to those watching at home. So I come before you and the Village Board on behalf of the Lions Club tonight. And before we have that tree election, August 1st is Riverside Day. Long standing time on tradition here in town, honoring someone who has committed themselves to the betterment of our community over a period of time. In a previous meeting, I announced that it was Jennifer White who has been named as Person of the Year. A dinner will be held in her honor on August 31st, Wednesday, at the Riverside Country Club. Cocktails will be at 6, dinner will be at 7. Tickets are available for purchase at Aunt Diana's, the library, and Riverside Bank for $45 a piece. Tickets will be sold until Friday, August 26th, and will not be sold thereafter or at the door. 
And if you have questions, you can contact me at 708-205-7428. And I look forward to seeing everyone there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next up, the reports of village officers. I have no report this evening. Ms. Francis. I have a number of items to report on. First of all, I have a business update. I wanted to notify residents that Athletico has completed interior demolition. Um, they are um, in the storefront that is formerly Arcade Jewelers. So they've completed the interior demo and are completing the now their interior remodel. Both Saw Millie and La Barra, formerly known as Pizza Bar, are working on the interior remodel of their respective storefronts. Additionally, the village has received um, a letter of intent from a restaurant on Burlington that will uh, take that will uh, have their storefront in the building that is closer to Harlem down Burlington. Additionally, the village is working with a local business owner to establish a pop-up store during the holidays in the train station, and this item will be discussed further and require board action in upcoming meeting. I wanted to provide a streetscape, streetscape update. The East Burlington project is projected to be completed by the original completion date of September 13th with major construction including paving, masonry, planters, brick pavers, and electrical work to be completed before Labor Day. Upcoming work includes the completion of brick paver installation, completion of masonry planters, asphalt grinding and paving, planting installation, irrigation drip line installation. After Labor Day, the remaining work will, will include a punch list of items and sod installation. Um, the next item is the Consolidated Dispatch. Um, West Central Consolidated Communications received notification from the state that they will provide us an extension to provide final items related to our consolidation. The state has provided the group until January. However, we'll be submitting items that they've requested as they are completed. The next matter is the BNSF train station lease. If you recall, the village board had previously executed an agreement. The village has received an executed agreement from BNSF regarding our train station lease. So that will allow the train station project to move forward. The birth project will be bid in November. Work may commence in late 2016. However, the project will not be completed until early January, uh, early 2017. We're hopeful that it will be in January, but obviously it will be weather um, contingent. The paver, railing, and pillar work will be completed this year. Another item is the Riverside Library is working with the village to structure a short-term loan and transfer of funds for them to have payment for their HVAC system replacement. Staff is assisting them with this process and a formal approval of the loan will be made at an upcoming meeting. This loan is a cost-effective option for both the village and the library as they will pay less in interest in fees versus going to the private market. Uh, smart Grid and Comet update, as of the end of 2015, 3,999 advanced metering infrastructure meters were installed. Uh, currently, COM is exceeding their targets for implementation of the program throughout the state. COMED has a total of 13 circuits within Riverside to maintain. New poles and lines have been installed as part of COMED's performance improvement plan. However, the lines have not yet been livened by ComEd. ComEd anticipates livening these lines in September. They have not provided an exact date. That's their target date right now. What they're saying is within September. Um, the next item is our resurfacing project that will take place on East Quincy and Long Common. This project was led by the state last week. The lowest bidder was K5 Construction with a bid award of $1.254 million. Long Common will be resurfaced from Harlem Avenue to East Quincy. And um, East Quincy will be resurfaced from Long Common to Harlem. Construction is scheduled to begin mid-September and be completed by Thanksgiving. An update on the sidewalk replacement. Some of you might have noticed within the past couple of weeks that there was some saw cutting being done throughout the village. 
Um, the 2016 sidewalk program involves two primary aspects, replacement of defective sidewalk squares and saw cutting to eliminate trip hazards caused by vertically displaced sidewalk squares. The saw cutting part of the program was completed as targeted last week. The Village Board of Trustees awarded the sidewalk replacement bid to Globe Construction on July 21st. The portion of this program will begin in approximately three weeks. Defective squares identified for replacement have been marked with white paint. And finally, the, inter the MWRD interceptor project the Metropolitan, Water the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District has contracted with Kenny Construction to line the eight foot diameter, 800 year old intercepting sewer line that lies approximately 300 feet below Forest Avenue, Long Common and Riverside Road. The project is expected to take two years to complete beginning at First Avenue and Forest and proceeding eastward through Riverside, eventually exiting Riverside at Miller Road and Ogden Avenue intersection. Originally planned for an April 1 start, the project was finally underway in earnest at Forest Avenue and First Avenue intersection during mid-July, relining the sewer is a multi-step process that begins with cleaning the sewer, then inspection and repair, and finally installation of the geopolymer liner. The project is undertaken in 500 to 1,000 foot sections and the sewer is accessed through existing manholes. At each access point, various types of equipment are staged depending on specific process underway. In addition, the first and Forest Avenue intersections work sites in the future will be located near Forest and Lincoln Avenue intersections and then again near Forest and East Avenue intersection. Around active work sites, motorists should anticipate lane closures, detours, flagmen, restrictions, and delays. Alternative routes avoiding the work sites are recommended. Intermittent road closures may occur if the village has provided advance warning, we will send out a notification to our residents. Currently, you will see detour signs that have already been placed for these intermittent closures. And that's all I have. I can just add one, one little coda to the regard to ComEd, we have asked them to come to our next board meeting to uh, explain what I consider to be an, an unacceptable amount of power outages in our village. Um, I know the, that Mr. Sedevi has notified me what over engaged there have been five, I think you said, Six. seven. And Riverside Foods has been negatively impacted by the, the recent power outages as well. So we have asked them to come to our next meeting. We haven't heard back from them yet. Um, I fully expect someone from ComEd to come and answer our questions, so we'll keep you updated uh, on that as well. Any questions from the trustees about our projects? I think um, to expand on the Commonwealth Edison issue, um, in replacing poles and livening the lines, there's been a pretty significant impact to homeowners that either have an existing pole or a connection in their yard. And I don't think adequate notice, because I'm one of those, and I don't think adequate notice was, actually no notice was ever provided until ATVs and heavy equipment showed up in my backyard. Um, other residents have had materials stored in their backyard for months. Um, so that's something that they absolutely need to answer to. And there's a lot of, it's not Commonwealth Edison, it's a subcontractor <laughs> and all that, but we'd like to get that sorted out. Um, I agree. And I don't know, are they gonna be done with this work now or are they, how far into this work are they? As far as they are telling us, now obviously it's being conveyed with whomever their contractor is and through them right. that essentially things should conclude. However, I haven't received final confirmation that the AT&T equipment that was on the right. ComEd poles have been moved over. Right. The village has facilitated a discussion because Previously, there wasn't a very good discussion between ComEd and AT&T, so at least we've provided them the correct point of contact to, to help progress this project moving forward. But unfortunately, I haven't received final confirmation that that has actually taken place. Yeah, because I think it's not until AT&T restrings theirs that they can remove the old poles. So it's it's been a six months, seven months now of a work site for a lot of homeowners. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other person that needs contacted with this Com Comcast, or uh, yeah, Comcast. Um, I had a resident call me and tell me that they, you know, they cut the pole down in his backyard up to the Comcast box. 
So he's got the new 18 or the new ComEd pole, and then four feet farther is this pole that's half cut with a Comcast box on it. I can unfortunately attest to that. That's how they do it. Um, Comcast comes through, they cut it down halfway, and then when AT&T comes through, they actually remove the entire pole. So it's kind of, that means they're halfway through the, the process. Well, you know, we went through this a while back. Uh, we had a number of power outages up on, in the Northgate area, and it actually, we finally had to get uh, Representative Zaleski involved before Comcast would come yeah. and talk to us. So hopefully that won't be required this time. They'll, they'll come and respond to our inquiries. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Moving on next is the approval of consent agenda. Are there any items that need to be removed for discussion? Hearing none, I'd ask for a motion and a second to approve. So so motion, second. motion by Ms. Hamilton, second by Ms. Collins. Please call the roll. Trustee Valerie. Aye. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Lumsden. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Sedeby. Aye. Trustee Hamilton. Aye. Motion carries. Next is reports of departments, commissions, and trustee liaisons. Are there any liaison reports this evening? Next is ordinances and resolutions. We have a resolution authorizing uh, an encroachment of an awning into the public right-of-way. Uh, this is associated with the Labara project uh, at 2 East Burlington. Is that? Yes, as you heard earlier, uh, Labara is working hard on their interior build out. Uh, they've also submitted a permit for their awning so that will go over their outdoor seating area. This awning does encroach over the village's sidewalk and right of way, and therefore does require village board approval before we can issue the permit. Uh, they're proposing to have outdoor seating along Lawn Common, and their application shows the awning projecting over the entire outdoor seating area. The awning will extend past the property line and encroach about two to three feet. Um, over our portion of that sidewalk area. The zoning ordinance does allow for these encroachments, uh, but for no more than five feet over the public sidewalk. Uh, the fabric awning is going to have a vertical clearance of probably about nine feet. Their original uh, showed ten and a half, but it's looking like it's actually going to be closer to a nine-foot clearance, which is our minimum requirement for, for awnings. So they will still meet that and extends along about 49 feet along the frontage along Long Common. You do have a site plan um, attached to that that kind of indicates where this area will be, that the awning will overhang, and you have a resolution that authorizes this encroachment before you. So before we get to discussion or questions, I'd like to motion a second to approve. Approve. Motion by Ms. Collins, second, second. By, Mr. Second by Mr. Lumsden. Uh, discussion, questions for Ms. Abt. Mr. Pollock. What will be the uh, effective distance of, of the sidewalk then between the awning and this outdoor patio and the trees? Um, it's going to be about, I want to say, six to seven feet. Okay. And will the, uh, the new awnings, will the building match uh, or are all the awnings on the building being changed or? um i believe all the awnings are going to be changed but only this area is going to be one that projects this far um, all the other ones will be about the same size as the existing awnings i think there just might be a slight color change or um, they'll be putting some lettering on the ones along burlington but they've not submitted their sign plans for that yet at this point they're just focusing on trying to get the awning over the um, the outdoor dining area done because it does require some structural work on the inside given its its depth. Mr. Seddon? Uh, I'm, I'm fine with the canopy but I had a question uh, and this comes from the drawing I don't think we addressed it but they show a patio railing on village property is that temporary is that permanent what what well the we railing portion is that? actually on their property um, their their building is is set back from their property line so uh, the railing is actually on their property, but we do have the easement um, access to it. We are not going to allow them to permanently attach it to the pavers, uh, but they do have to separate off somehow their, their dining area. So we are working with them, but they haven't put in their formal proposal for So exhibit A here is wrong. It's incorrect. I, it's incorrect. How do you mean? Because it shows the patio railing outside the property line. So it's it's a little bit off, yes. 
So that so the seating area and the rail are all within. That will all be within the property line, and there'll okay. be a couple feet overhang for right. the canopy. Because I'm not necessarily opposed to allowing this, mm -hmm. but I, if we have to do something with it, we ought to do something with it. Right, and they would be allowed. I mean, that'll be part of their approval process. If it does need to encroach a little bit okay. over onto onto the public right of way, that'll be under your your purview to approve when they're ready to come, go forward with their outdoor dining plan. Other questions, comments? Okay, thanks, that. Please call the roll. Trustee Gallery. Aye. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Lumsden. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Sutton. Aye. Trustee Hamilton. Aye. Motion carries. Next up under considerations uh, is our continued discussion of keeping bees and uh, chickens in Riverside. So you have before you the, uh, um, were you going to introduce this or should we just plow into it since we, I think everybody knows, knows where we are. Um, <clears throat> you'll see the, the, ch the changes from our last board meeting and you also have on the uh, agenda history sheet some of the, the remaining issues that need to be discussed tonight with regard to beekeeping. Um, these are the ones I enumerated from the last meeting. If you have others, please uh, bring them up. Uh, what should the required setback be for an aviary? Should there be min a minimum lot size required for an aviary? Should fencing, gates, and signage be required? And should routine treatment for the burrow mites be requi required? And then the main issue with regard to the keeping of hens was what should the required setback be for a coop and run? So let's, uh, let's take up the beekeeping ordinance first. And I'll just open it to general discussions. But I, had, I had one thing. Um, in D3, it has a uh, statement that for renewal of their license, if they have received no complaints, if the village has received no complaints, I'd like to change that to something like receives no complaints to determined to be of merit or something like that, because anybody can complain about something, but it may not be a meritous complaint. So somehow to make a distinction between just trivial complaints and complaints that are determined to be of merit. I don't know what wording. And that's on both, um, both, both, both right. documents. I, I had the same concern. I just thought it should be changed to violations. Right, you something not complaints. Carolina, how to handle that? Yeah, I think, uh, I think violations would be the most appropriate. That's right. So that uh, there'd be some due process to the whole thing correct before it's, it would be counted against you it's so c, some, so c3 and hands and like D3. If, if no violations have been issued or no yeah. violations found, have found to exist i think yes yeah. but we could okay. something okay. like that if you want to add it then i would we'll okay. do a review of this before right. it's final so right. that kind of thing we can just okay so it's that c3 and hands it was under c3 right. and hens. c3 okay yeah no hens. i think it's d3 in, in bees, it's D3, and, and hence, I thought it was C3. I could have written it down wrong. Yeah, in, in, the, in the hen ordinance, it's, uh, it's C3, and then the other one, in the bees, it's D3. Right. Oh, wait. Yeah, but yeah, because there's a, a, an extra thing about hives in here, okay. So, any other general comments? What about the setback question? Both the, both the lot size and the setback were really kind of the main issues that we were talking about last time with regard to these. I, I can speak to that I did a little bit of research, just went on Google, did half a dozen properties, and then figured out where you could actually put it in if you were a resident that wanted to have it. You had the 10,500 square foot requirement met. Where could you actually put it? And there's a lot of lots because they triangle back to smaller districts. There's nowhere to do it. So the comment that some of the public was making is pretty accurate if you just take it. And I only did five. I just did a random sampling real quick. And of that, basically it would be almost like a water fountain statue out in the middle of your backyard because if your lot line, and, and I did my, my property is one, and it's 75 feet at the rear of the lot. If we, we held them to 25, you have basically a 25 by 30 box in the middle of your backyard where it would be compliant. So I, I think that the 25 foot setback personally is too much. And some of the other villages that have five and tens would open up a lot more properties to have the opportunity if we're gonna do it. 
So I bet you if you went through and did all of them, you're probably talking maybe 20 or 30 properties that would be able to have them at somewhere plausible. Is that, so is that right because of the setbacks or because of the, the square setback. footage? The, set, the setback is what drives it to right. be in the center of your property, right? Right. The, the 10,000 square foot, there's a real nice diagram that shows two colors, right? It probably brings it to about half of the properties. So I would propose, and again, I'm, everybody already knows that I have no issues with, with either one. I would propose that we look at, if we're going to do it off of a property line, do it either five or 10 feet. I think that that would open it up to a lot more properties and still not have any neighbor nuisances. I, I don't have an issue with that because I think if there's a nuisance going on, our codes already require and have opportunities to enforce it. Just like if somebody has a nuisance dog or a nuisance pet or kid or whatever's going on, we have an opportunity to, to deal with it that way. Um, so that's just kind of where, where I'm at on that. So I, I don't, I, I don't see a need for the square footage size at 10,500 or I think we'd be better off going with some sort of a setback if we're worried about it being too close to someone's property. Or I did do some reading and, and some folks said if you have a fenced in backyard they allow you to be closer. If there is no property fence between your property and another then they ask you to have right. a farther standoff. Right. That seems pretty plausible, fair and reasonable as well. I think particularly, I agree with Trustee Lumsden, and I, I think particularly because we are talking about this being a trial ordinance. Uh, I don't think we should make it so restrictive that we're eliminating so many people from even uh, participating in it. That seems, <laughs> if that's what we're going to do, why don't we just say we're not going to do it? Um, which is what it seems like to me with the restrictions that have been placed in this ordinance. I, I agree. Um, I'm much more open to having fewer restrictions because it is a pilot program and if there are issues we can deal with that. Um, I also don't, um, I would like to see a 10 foot setback personally um, and I don't have a preference for square footage. I think I. My, my question is, are, are, is, is our village driving the setbacks is, or is the, yeah. Or the reason that we're having an issue with these setbacks is the way our, our village is laid out, the way the, the way the backyards all group up into to one backyard. Uh, I, I share backyards with, with five with five homes. That's not what happens in Lyons or Brookfield. Um, those towns also have alleys, which is going to be, in, again, a natural buffer of probably 20, 20 feet between the rear properties of homes. So, you know, my question is, is the setback, are we tailoring these setbacks because our properties are not conducive to the, to the, the, the raising of bees? Um, I, I, you know, I don't know that answer. I, I mean, I've seen a lot of different, you know, setback requirements. Um, and, you know, it's, some are 20, some are 25, some are 10. Um, but I think we have to look at those villages and, and look at our village, look at their layout, and look at our layout, and see if our layout is what's driving the concern. Um, because, you know, in my backyard, I touch another backyard. A lot of backyards, I don't touch another backyard in other communities. Um, some that do, they're big properties, and that's why they have some of these larger square footages. Um, so I just want to lose lose the, the concept of you know how Riverside is laid out and how we are unique and, and is that uniqueness um, making this this issue um, not necessary not necessarily viable I I agree with Trustee Lumsden on the setbacks. I think we can reduce those. But likewise, I, I as I said at the last meeting, I, I don't know why, what the magic of 10,000 square, 10,500 square feet is as opposed to 7,500 or whatever the, the normal lot size is in Riverside. Um, you have 10,500 square foot lots next to in a neighborhood full of 7,000 square foot lots. The beehive is, 10 feet or whatever we say it is from the property line, why does that extra 3,000 square feet make a difference? Um, so I would be inclined, unless 
someone can show me a reason why why that's necessary, I would be inclined to eliminate the 10,500 square feet as well. Um, I'm also a little bit concerned about the requirement that they be fenced in. Um, I'm not sure about that one, but in a way that just, I could see that making it more obtrusive because all of a sudden now we're making people build this fence around it as opposed to just this little five square foot hive that no one even notices it, that it's there, but now you got to put a fence all the way around it. And if you're not fencing in the whole yard, then you're just going to have this little fenced area in the middle of your yard and it almost draws more attention to it. You the anecdote, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say the anecdote that you had told last time about um, that could lead to someone being trapped in that area. I, I do not like the idea of the, of the enclosed area also. I mean, my sense from looking at the various ordinances is that, that the fencing is redundant with if, you have, if you require the flyway. Because mm -hmm. if you're going to have a six foot flyway, the obstruction anyway, it seems to. <clears throat> You know, again, I, I looked at a lot of them and I saw fencing around this. Again, you're fencing in 65,000 bees in a hive. Um, you know, again, our, our, our backyards all touch each other. It's not uncommon for kids to run between backyards. Um, and, you know, in the middle of the night, you run into a beehive. Um, that, I don't think that's, a, that, that's an uncommon scenario that you can see in our village. Um, so I, I you know, I... In, in, in front of my house right now, in the tree, there's a hole in the tree out there. There's a beehive in that one. If you go across the street into the park, we have four, four beehives within 150 feet right now, just by nature, currently at my house which is kind of an interesting statistic to think about when you walk around and the kids are running around, they're riding their bikes into that tree all the time and knocking the bees out. Okay, they're and they're loving the it. Tree, they're not going to knock it over. Um, I, I'm not, I'm, I, I, you know, I, again, I'm. I would be more inclined to say that the backyard has to be fenced in than that there has to be an enclosure around the beehive, if that's a concern. I, I would, I would be more conducive to that. Because I agree, a, a six foot thing around, that's, that's just not going to look very good. I don't see the point in that. But I don't have a problem with saying they have to have their backyard fenced in if that's a concern that you have. I, but I just, my time on planning and zoning, I think we generally were anti-fence and we didn't want to do things to encourage fencing. Yeah. So it's, that's what I'm struggling with that. That's a solution to potentially this problem, but the unintended consequence. But again, I'm not sure how many circumstances we're talking about. In general, um, I'm not opposed to reducing or eliminating the lot size. Um, I think five feet and even 10 feet setback is not adequate. Um, I, can, I, I certainly can come off of 25, but um, I think you need more than 10 feet of setback personally. And I'm not a, that concerned with the fencing at all. So I think I hear a consensus so that in, in D2, it would just say an apiary shall be permitted only on lots with single family detached dwellings and eliminate the square footage. Is there a consensus on 15 feet for a setback? I'm fine with 10, so whatever. I'm fine with 15. Yeah, okay. That still eliminates a whole lot of properties. Well, you know, right out the middle. Yeah, I, think just, I don't think many lots get less than 40 feet at the even when they kind but of then it's, then it's high. If you go, if you go 15, and it's, and it's kind of fun to do. Just go on Google and draw the lines out there, and it's all of a sudden you see this one one zone. I mean, so like I mean, you can't see this, but that's that's the spot that you could actually do anything in, right in the middle of your backyard, and I just don't think that's where anybody's going to want to put it. But see, so I think, I think the countervailing argument to that though is the purpose of the setback is to protect neighbors right so it may be that if you want to keep a, keep bees so, you're going to have to put it in the middle of your yard yeah. but that's better than having it sitting right beside a sidewalk where yeah you know, somebody yeah, can no, go walk think, and I, see that, and again again the ones that i were looking at i think and it's interesting you said that because i think every property i looked at already had a fence around it just by the ones i picked so, I mean, that's, so, you know, that's, I mean, that's, 
I, mean, I saw some of those, those, those ordinances as well. You could say something where, you know, if the yard is not fenced, it's a 15, 15 foot setback. If it's fenced, you know, it's a five yeah, foot setback or something like that. I mean, I, I have seen, I have seen those. I would get to the fact that if you did have an open backyard with five families sharing a backyard and one person wants to stick it out in their yard, it, it, it is more in their yard rather than on a property line when kids run around and play. I mean, that, that would go a long way to, to, to help Joe's concern. I didn't, I didn't follow. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know. You have five I, backyards I don't, I don't, with no I don't, fences. I don't want a beehive within five feet of my backyard. No, it wouldn't. Fifteen if there's no it fence. It would be fifteen if there's no fence. I, if there's a fence, I don't, I don't want a beehive within five feet of my backyard. I don't care if my neighbor has a fence. I still don't want a beehive within five feet of my property line. You probably already have a couple of them. I don't mind, I don't mind the 50 bees that are in my trees. But 65,000 that are in that are in a nest, I, I don't necessarily want. I don't think you have 65,000 bees in front of your house in the four hives that you have. I didn't, didn't count. Okay. I mean, I have a lot of them in my backyard. They're all over my 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 flowers. Um, I just don't want them within five feet of my lawn. Yeah, and I, I tend to agree with Trustee Ballerine too. I think the number of beehives we're going to have here are going to be significantly less than the number of people that don't want beehives, period. So if you just happen to have one of those people that maybe the whole family's allergic next door, those are the people we have to look out for, frankly. I mean, we're not eliminating the ability to have bees, we're adding the ability to have bees. So I think we have to be cautious in how we're doing it. And if you want to have bees, there should be some sacrifice. Because, yes, if I wanted to have bees, I'd love to stick it out in the back corner of my lot. I think that's human nature, right? That's where we don't want them, I don't think. So is there, since it's this point, just on the 15-foot setback and leave the fence out of it, the fence, you know, the yard out of it? Yes? Um, what about the fencing gates and signage? component of the ordinance. I don't, I don't see fencing signage even need to be in there personally. The last thing I want is a hope I'm, I'm trying to design the world, not yeah. increase signs. And again, again, my sense is, is that it's redundant of the flyway restriction. So strike that? I agree. Yes. So the only thing left is the varroa mites, the, tr the required treatment for varroa mites. And again, I, I haven't found that anywhere. I looked again. Google, I, but, Google. No, no. Google managed bees affecting the wild bee population. No, I, I, I'm not disputing the issue. I'm just saying I haven't found an ordinance anywhere where well, it requires people to treat. I understand that. Just because we haven't found it doesn't mean it's not not a good it's, idea. It's up I mean, to, it's up because to what you. we're doing, what you're doing, is you're bringing in parasites from other parts of the country, um, and then those parasites are affecting the natural ecosystem in our own village. I mean, it's there was a study at the University of California. I mean, there's they, it's 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 happening all over. The is country. there is to your knowledge, is there is there any kind of standardized best practice for the treating of these mites? Do you have some sort of treatment that they give them, some sort of spray or, I don't know, you'd have to talk to a bee guy, but there's the guy at the farmer's market treats his bees. Yeah. And I think Tom, Tom was speaking if he does that. I mean, it's a, it's a, a spraying process. Actually, Tom said he doesn't do that, but he said he could. Oh. He said he's licensed Man, to I don't do think it. he does it to his own but bees. But he doesn't do it to his own bees. But yeah, you're right. I've never, never seen it, but that doesn't. I mean, that, I mean, this, this would be a scientific question. I mean, we'd have to find out if there's an actual, a, a proper way to do it, timing, time of year, all that kind of thing. If, in order, because we, we, we just can't have something nebulous in here that you have to treat right. for varroa right. mites. So, I agree. That so mean, you wanna, do you want to see if you can find out when the perfect find out what is, if there is such <laughs> a. Uh, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> can I just vote against the bees now, so I won't have to have to find this out? Maybe we should keep in mind if we're we're requiring something. If, for example, we get a complaint, and community development has to go out. How do we verify that they've done these? 
treatments, especially if they're licensed as well. well I mean, that's that a challenge. Yeah, I mean, even like even like when we have to do when when the rural agriculture folks require us to spray for something, then we have to show them the receipt that the certified sprayer actually did it. That's the way we have to prove when so like noxious weeds and things process. like that, so that it doesn't keep continuing to. So yeah, that would be a very simple to way state. to police I'll that. take it off your plate, Mr. Ballerine. I'll reach out to the state because we have the, the Bee and Aviary Act. So I'm sure the state has these resources and I'll, I'll ask them about it. And if there's language out there that would work, I'll bring that back for you to consider. So um, other than that, do you want to sit with this a little bit longer or do we ask the attorneys to put together a formal ordinance for us to consider? I'm okay with going forward to a formal ordinance. Mr. Savvy? I'm struggling with it. Um, part of my concern, too, is we're talking about a one-year trial period. I mean, we should obviously have the ability to extend that trial period before making a decision, because I, I pretty firmly believe one year is not going to be enough. Well, that could always be done. I mean, you could always just put an ordinance on the agenda that extends it to two yeah. years, you know? Or you could set it longer, but you may, you know, you may not. Right. Then you could repeal it. As long as there's flexibility to, you know, obviously shorten or lengthen it. Um, I'm, I guess, somewhat reluctantly in favor of um, a trial. I, I think I'm okay with going ahead. I wonder if, though, I, I was looking for the language. I believe we said that uh, in the pilot project we'd allow up to 15. Oh. What's, why, why not lower that to like five? I mean, just to, you know, and, and have people sign off on this understanding, you know, something in, in writing from them, understanding that they don't have a right to continue this. They're doing this kind of at their own risk, knowing that the village could eliminate this after one. Well, that, is, that language is it. That is it. Yeah, okay. Well, um, my problem with lowering it to five is that do we, are we really going to go trial in that? Or is it just, it's such a small number that I'm not yeah. sure that we're really getting enough data. Exactly. I don't think you'd get five. No, this is, this right. is very expensive. Right. Um, I was just okay. going to ask, do we have any idea how many people are already keeping bees here that will be applying for this? I be believe it's more than five. That are currently? Mm -hmm. You think it is more than five? I do. I, I don't know. Okay. She says with a knowing look on her face. The underground bee movement. <laughs> 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 no, you're not counting Scott with his bees in his tree. Yeah, I got them all over the park. Forward those I'm not out the bees. Okay, so how about this side? Go forward with the drafting of the ordinance? I'm okay. yes. obviously for it, so. Okay. I'm not. Okay, all right. That's bees. Yes. Uh, and you'll notice in both that, uh, that we the village now has the responsibility for notifying the adjacent property owners that an application has been put in. Uh, same question about the setbacks, 15 feet there as well, or? Mm-hmm. Before we get into the specifics of it, I, I, I think this is a completely different animal, <laughs> if you will, than, than bees. It's completely, to me, it's completely different for, for two reasons. One is that there's a, you know, I view the bees as there, there's a significant public benefit to the beekeeping. You know, there's a shortage of bees. I don't, I'm no expert in that, but you read about that all the time. And there's a spin-off benefit to the urban landscape for having bees. Um, and the other, so that's one. The other concern is that with, the, I think with chickens, you have a much greater potential for impact on a neighborhood or on a neighbor. From what I, the limited amount of information I know about keeping of chickens, just seems like there's a greater impact. So I, you know, 
so to assume that uh, you yeah, know we should, would apply similar standards i don't think we could make that assumption i think you gotta you know start from scratch and just say if we're going to do this and i guess i'd want to hear from the other trustees if, before we get in a long discussion about the details whether or not you know even if, no matter what the details are is this something that the majority of us want to proceed with and I'll, I'll start i i'm torn and i'm kind of leaning toward not doing it now um you know just starting with the bees <laughs> seeing how that goes but uh, i i am not sure i am really torn on this one Sorry. as i just said uh i think that there's probably to, to I think there's a greater potential for negative impacts what, on neighbors. What, 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 kind of, can you flesh that out? What kind of negative impacts? Uh, predators, uh, smells, noise. So, so how do we tell a family that would prefer to have a chicken or two in lieu of a dog or two? I think that that's, that's what I'm struggling that with. That answer, answer is very simple. People move to this village knowing you can have dogs. They, well, they I, knew they I moved to this village not knowing I couldn't have chickens. So well, that's that, that on bonus me. is on, on me. Yeah. But I'm just saying, I don't I don't know how I can how I can tell a family that has came to us and said there's no public problem with having a chicken, and we can say it's perfectly fine to have a dog next door, or two dogs next door, or three dogs next door that bark and howl and crap and do all sorts of stuff. How do I tell them no? You can't have a chicken. That's what I'm struggling with in, 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 in all of this, is how, how can we sit here and tell somebody else what they can do on the property that they worked hard and they have, and they should have the right to be able to find the public, private pleasures that they want to have in their property, as long as it's not hurting anybody else. A small dog in the backyard, our neighbor's dog was eaten by a, a coyote, right? So, I mean, predator issue, bird, feathers, dog, fur, I don't see a difference in that. So that's where I'm struggling with, where, where do we sit here? Why are we so proper to be able to tell somebody, no, you can't have two chickens? I'm having a big issue with that. Until somebody tells me there's a big, you know, a, 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 an issue with salmonella or something like that, that's something proven that's a health issue. I get that, but I'm not there yet. So that's kind of why I've been supportive of these. I, I, I have two responses to that. One is I think you know, dogs are domesticated and you have an expectation that you're going to have dogs in your neighborhood. You don't necessarily have chickens. Now, having said that, I can tell by the way, Trustee Lovson, by what you're saying, you know more about this than I do. You I raised have, on a farm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so I think my well, other response. If pigs up or I'm going to be in that same boat again <laughs> because. You know, my other response is that stuff. we need to be educated maybe, mm -hmm. you know, because there's, there's a fear yeah. that chickens are worse than dogs. I would, and you so, raised chickens. You've had chickens, right? I would, um, I'd love for you I, to speak to I, I don't want to hear testimony right. that I want that's, to see it. Yeah, that, that's perfect. I, I mean, if you can, you know, show me half a dozen places in the surrounding communities place. that have chickens, I'll go look at them yeah. and, you know, figure it out. Because I think the other thing that would be helpful is to, if, if we could find some locations <laughs> with and here's why, because I'd love to talk to their neighbors, right? Is, is if I'm, if I'm, if I'm, if Jay and Jen next door decide to have a chicken coop, I'm very interested to see what some right. of those folks' and I, neighbors and, have to and say. And the local code enforcement officer. Yeah, I totally, I think that's perfectly acceptable. But, um, Rob Nixon, uh, Riverside resident. There, there is a chicken coop tour that's organized um, by the Chicago chicken enthusiasts. It's after Labor Day, it's in September. And uh, they have probably two dozen or three dozen locations of homes with chicken coops, typically in the Chicago area. Chicago allows the keeping of backyard hens. Uh, but there are some in the suburbs. So it's pretty well organized. It's free. Um, I could send Kathy or Jessica the details on it. That'd be great. I would appreciate that. And as, personally, yeah, as someone whose child has been bitten by a dog on two occasions within the village, one in a uh, storefront and uh, another occasion in a person's home, chickens really aren't a threat to anyone's physical safety. And I love dogs as much as the next person. Um, I don't think we want to pit chickens against dogs, but on the physical threat, the dog would uh, chickens don't pose too much. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I would also, I'd like to, to get that, find out when that is, and hopefully that's something some of us or all of us can, can participate in. But I'd also ask that staff contact code compliance officers in other villages that have had this for a number of years and find out their experience. I mean, do they get complaints about it? And if so, what's the nature of the complaints? I have a question. Uh, I was just wondering if, if anyone reached out to Oak Park because they went through this similar discussion just within the last few years. They had a prohibition on chickens for 80 years in their ordinance and they reversed it. And they've had chickens in their code now for I think three years. And I, they're not on our list, but they're pretty clo close to us, you know. So I'm just wondering if anyone reached out to them and asked have they had any problems since they've done that. Yes, they have. Yeah. Longer than three years. Yeah. yeah. So um, I would suggest then, why don't we just wait on this one? Let's. We'll, we'll, we'll have yeah. we'll have staff reach out to some of these compliance officers. We'll get the information from Mr. Dixon and those of you who would like to to go check out some coops. You can go on your coop tour. Get a growler and go. And uh, get a growler. Chicken coops and craft beer. Hopefully. And, uh, and then once we have that, once we have that information in hand, we'll bring this back up for further discussion. Okay. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. So to be clear, we're not authorizing. We are not authorizing them. anything on the hints at this at this point. Because yeah. I think I'd rather do this right. I think everybody Absolutely. find the right the right medium, the right distances is a good pilot program, and then really really understand it. I, I'm just curious what other people's experience are. The, the people that I've talked to, maybe it's a much different demographic, it's like 10 to 1 against. It's almost like, really? You're really considering doing this? Um, and frankly, that's the camp I'm in too. Uh, I don't think I would want, or I know I wouldn't want it next door, so it's hard for me to vote for something that I wouldn't want next door to me. I think we've established that they attract predators. I think we've established that they um, spread disease um, it's hard to overcome that in my mind is this something that we could perhaps discuss as putting as a referendum item it's an I don't think it's necessary personally I think it's a lot of money to run a referendum item when you can run a trial program for yeah. a year yeah, for me, I think there's so few people that are interested in this that I hate to spend very much more money on the, than we have already, um, which is why I, I would be more in favor of a pilot program and just try it out. And if it's fine, fine. If it's not, we gave it a shot um, rather than to spend a lot of time on this issue. But you should avail yourself of the opportunity to go check some of these people oh, sure. out because you might feel differently after you see them. Okay. I, I, I'm, I agree with what Trustee said to me. Um, I'm sorry, Rob. I don't, I don't get it. I mean, we can. We have a farmer's market where you can buy all the farm fresh eggs that you possibly can ever want. We can have a farmer's market where you can buy the honey. Why, why anybody wants to spend this kind of money to, to raise their own hens um, and then only have them really produce for two years and then you got to figure out what to do with them. Um, and I mean, I mean, just the, just the, yeah, great. There's, there's 611 cases of Seminole in the whole United States in 45, 45 states. Is that going to mean it's going to hit Illinois or, you know, or hit Riverside? No, but is it, is it worth the, is it worth the risk? I mean, when you can buy the eggs for three dollars, four dollars a dozen over there, I buy, I buy mine for two dollars a dozen. Farm fresh. The guy goes and picks them out of the hen house for me. Um, I, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't understand it. Um, and I wouldn't. I'm. I wouldn't want it living next to me. Um, and I've been in a hen house. Um, I've, I've I've seen nice hen houses. I would assume your hen tour is going to be like the koi tour. You know, it's going to be the finest koi ponds in in Chicago. You're not going to you're not going to find the guy that um, is not a good hen owner, or else he's not going to make the hen tour. Um, and I'm sure your hen house is is wonderful and. If you know you were my neighbor, I probably wouldn't have a problem with it because I know you're responsible. It's not it's not the responsible people that I worry about. Um, it's the same with dogs or other pets. I mean, when there's there's a presumption of competence. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the Windy City Coop Tour, by the way, September 17th and 18th. I sent the info to, to Jessica. But, um, you know, you're going to see a variety of coops on that tour. I uh, participated in it and other organizers. So you're going to see folks of limited means and people who have really nice coops. And people can keep it together on much smaller space than we have in Riverside. Um, but why do people do it? You know, it's a $60 tomato. And you can get fresh tomatoes from the Amish uh, farmer here at the farmer's market for infinitely cheaper than growing them yourself. Um, part of it is satisfaction of producing some of your own food, and you can do that year round. So the hens are laying more in the summer, but you're gonna get eggs year round, okay, throughout winter. And they'll lay more than two years. It's not like this, a quick, there's typically a two year cycle in an industrial laying operation where those hens have light all year round. The amount of light determines how, much, how often they're gonna lay eggs. But if you're not providing that artificial light, they slow down in winter, and you're gonna have a, a laying hen for you know, four years or more. Um, you can also integrate it in your gardening practices. I mean, how you treat that waste, you've gotta deal with it. It's like a cat. You've gotta clean the litter box. If you have a cat and you're never cleaning that litter box, your house is gonna stink. Or you can be an irresponsible cat owner and just let the cat go all over the neighborhood. Chickens, you know, it's, it's a task, but the rewards are you've got some uh, very fresh eggs for cooking. Um, you've got a much more robust recycling opportunity, and you can return that productive waste once it's composted for a short period of time into your yard and your garden, and you could have really nutritious uh, soil. So it's kind of, why do you do it? It's like, why do you keep a dog? Why, why would someone spend the money, the time, and the effort to have a dog? People derive some enjoyment from it. They like getting out to walk the dog or observing it as an animal that's part of their life. So hens provide that for some people. But they yeah. say on the Windy City Tour, do not bring your dog. Well, <laughs> dogs, because they, dogs <laughs> defecate on other people's property. So maybe people don't want them on their property kind of walking about, doing their business, and, you know, they do attack chickens as well. I understand the um, that that you don't understand why people do it because I don't understand why people would want to do it either. To me, it just seems like a lot of work. But to me, it's like not our job to figure out why they want to do it. It's our job to figure out is there a reason why they can't. And so, if we can't come up with a good reason why they can't, then we should allow it. In my mind, and uh, the pilot program again, I think allows us to see if there's reasons why we don't want them to do that. I don't personally know because I haven't been around a lot of chickens, but. I, I think my concern with the pilot, and I guess this goes to the bees too, and it might seem counterintuitive, but what are we gonna know in a year? I don't think we're gonna know anything. I don't know if we're gonna know anything in two years. So that's my concern with the path that we're going down with this. I don't have any, re any why couldn't we just say that the annual renewal, it's, it's not an automatic. I mean, that every year it's up for discussion of to whether or not, you know. I thought the idea of having a pilot was so that we had a legitimate way to stop it if we did have. Right. Uh, you know, but if, if a year goes by and there are no complaints and everything seems to be working fine, then I don't see any reason why it can't be extended. Again, my, maybe looking on the negative side of things, though, and are the responsible people going to come out during the pilot period? Maybe yes, maybe no. Once it's allowed and they know that this is something that they'll be able to keep, not necessarily remove in nine months, six months, depending on what time of the year we enact this, you could have adverse selection either before or after the trial period. So that's what I'm struggling with. I just don't think a year is long enough trial period. So maybe we, I, I, we can deal with that later. but. What is the cost of a referendum? Why are we saying a referendum is so prohibitively expensive? I'm not suggesting we advocate for or against, so what is the cost of a referendum? I, I mean, I don't know what the cost is. It seems, I, I don't find this to be referendum worthy. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a decision that this board can make. I mean, I, 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 mean I, what I'm hearing still and, and I'm complete, I'm, all I know about this whole topic is researching the ordinances, is, um, is a lack of education on the subject. 
Uh, I, I, you know, you say that it's established that they attract predators. I don't think that is established. I think it's far more established that bird feeders attract predators than chickens. I mean, I was sitting in my house the other day and I was looking at, at you know, five um, uh, pigeons in the backyard. That's more than we're, that's more than we're talking about here with, with the, the we're only talking about two to four birds, birds, two to four. And I think some of what, I think some of the images that are in some of y'all's minds, you know, is like the Purdue farm, you know, where there's thousands of chickens and there's this horrible odor. And we address these things in the ordinance. And, and the reason we're talking about it in large part, I think, is because of the, of the era in which we live. I mean, farm, farm to table has become a growing phenomenon in America. That's why we're suddenly talking about bees. That's why we're suddenly talking about, about hens. So, I, but there are people in this village, and, and Trustee Sedevi has talked to them, and they have come up to me too. They deserve a voice too. Absolutely. Um, and that's that's where I, I said they deserve a voice also. I don't think I don't I don't hear anybody so, saying that they don't. I, I, I'm not saying, but we're we, we're hearing one side, and there are people that are dead set against having chickens living next door, and I've heard that from a number of people. And I and I think on the other side, on the demand side, we've heard. Four residents, five, I don't know the number, but it's single digits that are promoting this. When I pulled, and I pulled about 25 folks that I go to regularly on that, and only one had an opposition to it, and, and until we had a little bit of a learning curve that, that hens don't go cock a doodle do, and then there was gone away. So, I mean, reach out to people and ask them. Well, I, well believe me, maybe Joe and I are attracting the anti crowd, but it's. Uh, <laughs> Perhaps it's the way in, in which you ask your polling question. <laughs> There's no way you'd want chicken, right? I'll write the question. <laughs> I could, I, I've, had, I've had more people come to me and say, I have no issues with this. I think you guys are spending a bunch of time on it. Just pass it already and let them try it. And I've only had one person reach out to me and say they were opposed to it. And like I said, after we had a discussion a little bit more, they were like, ah, I guess it wouldn't be that bad to give it a try. So. Please. Have any of you heard from residents who have experience living next door to chickens? I have one. And they had issues with it? She had issues with it. Okay. Now, this, granted, this wasn't in the last six months. Yeah. This was many years ago. So. And how many chickens were there? I, I did not question her on the, the quantity of fowl. Um, she just told me how, how terrible it was. Because the only that. one I know, again, a rooster was involved, and I think that's an entirely different that's situation. Right. Yeah. And again, I think, that, I think that most of the people, either through humor's sake or not, that's the first thing that they say and think of. And then if you really get into what it's actually about, you're, you're probably not going to hear them next door. I mean, right, so we'll do some more research, get back to you, and then you'll have the opportunity to go do your own research if you want to in September. Uh, anyone have any new business? Hearing none, I'd ask for a motion and a second to adjourn. Motion by Ms. Hamilton, second, second by Mr. Lumsden. Please call the roll. Trustee Valerie. Aye. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Lumsden. Aye. Trustee Powell. Aye. Trustee Sedeby. Aye. Trustee Hamilton. Aye. Meeting is adjourned. Good night. No exit again.